uh, point out a couple of uh, uh, hope, hopefully obvious things, but the uh, uh, first of all, I wanted to point out that the talks, uh, and we appreciate everybody for coming out and talking, but the, the talks from all, all of our speakers here are, are their talks and not ours, and they don't represent the commission. Um, and uh, also, uh, similarly, uh, you'll see uh, both in the, from the talks and, and uh, on the tour later, uh, uh, those of you who are able to take the tour, uh, various instrument from, instruments from these various manufacturers. It doesn't mean we endorse any of the particular companies that are speaking here or that we have, uh, but uh, just examples of the technology. So anyway, with that, back to Matt. All right, this is going to start off our uh, spectroscopy block, and uh, we'll start with uh, Frank Higgins from uh, Agilent Technologies. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to talk about handheld and portable FTIR uh, applied to measuring phthalates and plastics. So this has been an ongoing uh, project for us. Uh, uh, we, we probably worked on this last year and, and uh, some more this year. But I'm an applications uh, development scientist at Agilent. Um, we were formerly A2 Technologies, and um, Agilent purchased us um, about, mm, what was it, last March. So I'm going to go through our products briefly, and then I'm going to go into some of the experimentation that we've done. So all of our instruments are made to be very rugged, and they're all based on a, a central core engine, which is our interferometer. It's a Michelson interferometer, and uh, it has a maximum resolution of four-wave four number resolution, and it's a full scanning, uh, the full mid-infrared range. Um, it's non-hydroscopic optics, um, so it can handle humidity and, and field applications. And we have what we call our portable, which are, you know, can be um, connected to a laptop and a power source, or our, our fully portable version, um, which has an onboard battery and uh, operates off a of PDA. And uh, we do ha have two handheld options. Um, one uh, has a clip that attaches to your waist, and uh, the other is just a, the same design only. Uh, all in one piece. So the exoscan is the, the one piece uh, unit, it's about seven pounds. Uh, it has interchangeable sampling interfaces. Um, our flex scan is four pounds, the optical head, and uh, the rest, it, again, attaches to your waist, and it's also PDA, and that has dedicated sampling interfaces. So these are some of the sampling interfaces that we have. We have a liquids and solids uh, single bounce ATR version. We have uh, metal coatings and um, surface cleanliness option, which is our external reflectance. We have a diffuse reflectance device that we use for our soils and rough, rough metal surfaces. Um, and then we have our grazing angle for very smooth, flat, shiny, metals. So we made the 4100 exoscan to be handheld but also very versatile. So if you want to set it up in a, a mobile lab or in your, in your lab, you can bring it and, and dock it to a docking station. And it has a clamp that clamps down your, your unit and uh, also a sampling um, pressure device for the ATR. So for phthalates, the challenge for infrared is to get enough path length with a handheld unit to be able to get down to the detection limits that we want. Um, and just to let you know, if you're not familiar with FTIR, all phthalates have similar functional groups. So any phthalate that is in a plastic is going to have absorbance at 740 reciprocal wave numbers. And uh, if it's not a phthalate, then it, it won't have absorbance there. So um, that is what we're focusing on in much of the work I'm going to show you here is that 740 absorbance band. So for our single reflection, um, our path length is about 2 microns into the sample at 1,700 weight numbers. So this is great for a screening tool for solids and liquids. Um, we have about a 1% total phthalates detection limit. Um, now this can just use 
the pressure of the device, the weight of the device onto a sample, or you know, simple finger pressure of the sample against the ATR. Um, I'll go into some other uh, details about that single bounce ATR device. Now our three reflection is very unique. It has very high throughput, um, which gives it an advantage as well as uh, it has a higher path length. So you're going three bounces into the, the sample. So that gives you about a six micron path length. And our experiments have shown a detection limit of quantitation, actually a limit of quantitation of 0.1% of the total phthalates. And we also have a nine reflection option, which we've shown to get down to 0.05% total phthalates. And that has a path length of about 18 microns. And it also has a flow cell option. Uh, available. I'll talk about that later. But uh, so this is a close-up of the three um, different devices: the single reflection diamond, the th the three reflection, and the nine. And you can see the the crystal uh, sizes. You know, of course, go up a as you get more bounces. Um, but our three reflection is only nominally more than our single reflection, um, just because of the design. It's a dicomp diamond design, um, so we get very uh, high uh, throughput. And that just gives you better signal to noise when you're measuring samples like these. And also, it's not recessed, so that, that diamond is, is slightly proud from the surface, so it's very easy to make contact with, um, you know, pliable plastics or even hard plastics um, if they're bendable to, to make contact with that ATR. Our nine reflection, you can see it's recessed. So I'll talk about that later. So our single reflection diamond um, on our exoscan is a rounded diamond. Um, so the infrared energy path um, is focused on the center of that diamond. The advantage of this is it makes it very easy to get spectra very quickly. Uh, and you don't have a large flat surface that you have to make contact with. You just have to make contact with that small center p place. So again, this is our diamond rounded ATR interface. It's an interchangeable attachment or it can be dedicated on our exoscan. This means that if you have a user that you don't want them to have the option of taking it off and on or, or misplacing it, it's all in one unit. It's dedicated for a purpose. Um, the interchangeable, again, you can change them out as you need. Um, and we have a fully handheld you know, option for phthalates. We have a method already developed for it. So some future developments associated with this is we could develop a three bounds diamond ATR exoscan attachment. Right now it's in our portable version um, only. So we also have the option of optimizing uh, an attachment for the, the handheld exoscan um, that would focus on maximizing the number of bounces and the path length uh, with the same contact area for the polymers, which is important because if you have too big of a diamond, even on an exoscan, if you have to make contact with a concave or a curved portion of the sample, it's best to have as small a crystal as you can. So this is our, our first uh, method that we did with these samples was on our um, nine bounce diamond and it comes in a configuration like you see up in the top corner um, but without that device it would be a flat uh, diamond there but it, it you know it'd be like a lunch box you could carry out to the field and measure samples anywhere um, so the absorbance again at 1740 46 here exactly is the ortho aromatic functional group of phthalates so any ortho aromatic phthalate will give you absorbance there um, we have samples shown here at 0, 0.24 and 0.6 total phthalates in, the, in these uh, final samples. And you can see our calibration curve there is very good and you know, our detection, our limit of quant is, is also very good. It's at about 0.05%. Excuse me, No, that's in the plastic, just pressed onto the diamond. Yep. 
I'll have a wider view of the spectrum here in a minute. So this is a, a, a wider view, so you could see some of the other bands in the infrared spectra. But I, I, I showed this slide to show our linear range capabilities. So we, we don't have to just focus on very low levels. We can quantitate all the way up into the high percentages, which might be a problem for some you know, LC preparations or, or GC preparations where if a sample is up around 50 percent phthalates, well, you might want, not want to inject it into your, into your GC. Um, and again, the calibration is, is very nice there. So this is how we prepare the samples for the nine bounce. You would have to take a cutout and, and then make a round punch. Um, we have a punch that's the exact diameter that you need. And then you simply press that with finger pressure to the diamond and you can get down to 0.05% again. Um, there's no solvents. It's, it's very simple. But, you know, a lot of people don't want to destroy a sample. Um, and, you know, this might be a little bit too much sample prep for a non-technical user. So we're trying to, to fix that with our three bounce. So this is the quant, the same, same samples done with uh, the three bounce diamond ATR and the, the dioctyl adipate um, plasticizer. So these are 0 0.24 and 0 0.6. And again, you, you can see we, we get a very good response. And these just require touching any area of the sample to the diamond. And this is the calibration uh, again for this. And this is just um, finger pressure. We don't need a press to do this. And this is in Dench, the same uh, concentrations um, that were provided by, by Matt a, a year ago or so. And that's the calibration for Dench. So this is just the technique. Um, you know, the diamond is prowled from the surface enough so that uh, if you press it against the metal, the diamond will be the first thing that contacts the sample. So it, it really makes it an ideal way to measure these. Um, it's available on the portable or the, um, the actual, you know, lunch, lunch box type of device. Um, the cons, again, the sample needs to be pressed flat on the diamond. If it's not completely on the diamond, like, or if you hit one of these letters and it's not completely flush, well, your analysis might not be as accurate. So we would always recommend measuring in multiple areas of a sample um, to make sure that, you know, you get a good average. So we also wanted to go another route where we did a solvent extraction and show, you know, our ability to be a screening tool in that way. And we, this way we can get down to lower uh, levels of detection but we also have the benefit of, of having a, a big average of a whole sample. So you can grind up a sample, extract it just like you do for the GC method, and analyze that THF directly by FTIR, and, and you would get the average of a whole sample. Um, so that some people would prefer that. So we have two ways to do this. Um, this is our, our tumbler or dial path technology. And you see the, the infrared beam path, which goes to um, two zinc selenide um, crystals that are matched. They're concave. So this prevents any spectral anomalies due to internal reflections. And um, it really has a very l uh, low, you know, uh, limits of quantitation because our signal to noise is very high in this instrument. Um, it, it's very close to the full size FTIR benches. Uh, mainly because you're focusing, you know, all that uh, interferometer into a small light path. So you get, you know, less uh, divergence of the infrared beam, and we just get a really high throughput with this. And uh, for this application, it would be a custom path length. Um, our standard path lengths are 50, 100, or 200 microns, but we can go as high as 1,000 microns, um, to analyze liquids, and you can look for places in solvents that there's no interference from the, you know, 
from the, the solvent with the analyte, and that's the case with THF. This is just a, an example of how you open and, and close the tumbler cell. So it's very qu quick to clean and very easy to use. And this is our THF extraction experiments where we, uh, we looked at phthalates um, spiked into THF. And we also did some extractions and uh, found that it worked very well. Um, this was done at 500 microns, but we can go up to 1,000 and still get uh, very good data. And again, you know, you can concentrate the sample and then run it as a concentrated, um, you know, uh, as you evaporate the THF, then you could run it and get even lower detection limits. Another thing that our, our software allows us to do is to do conditional reporting. Now this is, allows us to use multiple calibrations uh, to, to produce one prediction. So we can have uh, a low calibration, a mid, and a high, and uh, based on the conditions, the logic that you put in the, into the software, it will use the appropriate calibration um, to give you the the best accuracy and um, the best precision. And we also have the ability to set up um, a condition type matrix here like you see. where This is for bird's nest soup actually, which is a, another story altogether. But um, we, we wanted to set up conditions for the amount of sugar, um, MSG, um, carbonate in, in these products. And it's just we put limits on the absorption for these bands and we put them in our software and then it gives us one result. Um, either the result would be it may contain sucrose or it may contain um, feathers. Um, so all these different conditions can be used in our software. And you can set that up for phthalates so that if you have polyethylene or polypropylene or PVC, you can set up um, these conditions for those bands that you know will be there and it will use the appropriate calibration depending on the matrix. So just to conclude, the three bounce ATR is capable of 0.1% in vinyl plastic toys for phthalates. Um, these are non-destructive techniques and our nine bounce can do the 0.05% uh, total phthalates. Um, the portable exoscan can measure down to 1%. And this is all just pressing the sample to the ATR. Um, our solvent extraction technique can, can get down to the, the similar um, 0.1 or 0.05 detection limits, and even lower if we concentrated the sample. Um, and then our advanced software uh, conditional reporting allows multiple calibrations. So. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Okay. Yeah, are, are you restricted to only non-aromatic plasticizers? I know your examples had DOA and, and DENG. What about if you had a trimelitate or another non, you know, another aromatic or DOTP or something like this? Would you still have that same detection limit? No, the, the DOTP or, or the terephthalates, they don't have the same um, ortho-aromatic band. So in infrared, you know, your aromatic substitution changes the frequencies of those bands. So the, the answer is yes, we can, we can calibrate to um, samples that have other plasticizers that are not DENCH or DOA. Those are just examples. But to the same level, the same, same detection levels? Yeah. Any other questions? All right, let's thank Frank. Uh, next we have uh, Steve Pullins from Rigaku. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, thanks for having me, Matt. Thank you all. Um, I'm just going to do a, a basic introduction to uh, uh, Raman spectroscopy for use in uh, 
measuring phthalates. I haven't done really any studies. I have no good data to show you. But I'm going to talk about our company and a relationship. Well, my company, Basepec, in a relationship with Rigaku and what the future holds and, and what kind of capabilities you will have in your hand you know, with, these, with these Raman spectrometers. So yeah, Basebeck is my company, and we are located in San Jose. Our core technology is a, is a we make the diffraction gratings. Um, you know, we are the world leader in miniaturization of spectral engines. So it, in telecom, in, in the past couple of years, we've gone out into the spectroscopy market. <coughs> and as of the <clears throat> fourth quarter last year, Rigaku has built a uh, company, Rigaku Raman Technologies, which has uh, taken our product line and uh, they're a much, much bigger company. You see, 1100 versus 25. So we'll be able to, we'll be developing these applications in the very near future. What's nice about the, the, the Raman spectrometer and our spectrometers is we, we make this VPG, we call it, the, the volume phase grading. So there are no moving parts. It's a very, very rugged spectrograph. You know, it's got all the usual a thermal design. You know, and the, the enabling technologies come from telecom, which is where our heritage lies. You know, miniaturization of lasers. We see next is the uh, diffraction grading, sensors, processing power. Um, I show down here a few of these little spectrometers. These are these are fully functional Raman spectrometers that are run by with an iPhone app, and they are about this big. And we just <clears throat> finished developing one half is half the size. So I don't know how many of you are very familiar with Raman spectroscopy. I'm going to give a little brief introduction. So basically what you do is you, you, know, you shine the laser on a sample. Most of the light coming back is just at the same wavelength. You know, it's Raleigh scattered. Um, but about one in a million photons is scattered inelastically. It can either gain or lose energy to, to the sample by you know, one uh, basically unit of vibrational frequency in the molecule. <clears throat> so you know, the signal strength goes as one over the laser power to the, laser to the fourth power. Um, what's really nice about Raman is there's a very high degree of chemical specificity. And you'll see that. In a, in a few example spectra that I show you. Um, there's no sample preparation. You can measure through containers usually. You know, that makes it a very nice. And it's immune to the presence of water. There's the, you, you, you will not see a water interference in a Raman spectrum. And this, uh, a lot of you, especially the, the IR folks, are very familiar with these tables. Um, you know, we're talking organic bonds. You know, each has a characteristic frequency. In particular interest to us are, are the, um, the carbon-oxygen double bond stretch and the... Um, in the, in the fennel ring stretching. However, the, the downside in, in what's been limiting uh, the use of Raman spectroscopy in, in, in screening you know, plastics for recycling or phthalates and such is the fluorescence issue. Because this, this technique is uh, complementary with FTIR, but it goes about it in a completely different way. You know, we are shining 
you know, say, visible light onto a sample and getting back another visible photon that is just shifted by the uh, vibrational frequency. And when you're operating, you know, in the visible wavelength range, you have the chance of absorption and fluorescence. And historically, fluorescence has been the, the you know, big, big setback to using Raman spectroscopy, you know, to, to measure, uh, you know, colored plastics, for instance. Because, as you see, I, I've shown here, about one in a million photons scatters inelastically. You know, fluorescence, just absorption in fluorescence, you know, we're, we're talking one-to-one -one type relationship between input and output. So what that's telling us is a part per million levels of impurities, you know, dyes, for instance, not an impurity, but low, low, low concentrations of fluorophores will compete with the Raman signal. So, you know, you know, your UV vis absorption spectrum, you know, it, the longer you go, the longer wavelengths you go, the less likelihood there is of absorption of the laser uh, by the material, it, especially you start getting out of the visible, away from these uh, colors of these dyes. So, historically, you know, Raman spectroscopy has, you know, been a big benchtop system. You know, early days, 514, you know, that's an argon ion laser. It might be six feet long uh, on its own. You know, but, <clears throat> you know, 532, the shorter the wavelength, the stronger the signal, but the more likelihood you will absorb the laser and fluoresce and mask the Raman signal. Uh, so moving to 785 nanometers was a, a, a big revolution in Raman spectroscopy. I opened up you know, many more materials to be measured, but that's still deep red. There's still a lot of absorption. So based on our expertise in the telecom, we, we use uh, 1064 nanometers. So just, you know, just outside the visible in the, in the near infrared wavelength range, that further reduces fluorescence. And that's a big advantage because I can now measure a lot of colored plastics and just ID the plastic material. You know, because, you know, the, the downside of Raman is it, it doesn't detect very low levels, but that makes it immune to <laughs> detecting things like dyes and impurities. So here's one example. I, I know it's a, a pharmaceutical. That's kind of where I've been working a lot. But this is uh, just just to to show you kind of what people used to have to used to see when they use Raman spectroscopy on a colored sample. This blue curve is a nice fluorescence emission curve from the coating on this pill. When you turn around and, and go from 785 to 1064 you see right through that coating into the pill and you, and you can see the, uh, the caffeine and, and, and acetaminophen and, and aspirin in there. And, and as I mentioned before, Raman has a, uh, is similar to FTIR, has a very high degree of chemical specificity and, and that's going to play a you know, very important role in detecting phthalates because we also detect the plastics. So here I just pulled a, a, an old picture, kind of showing the kind of features from this, you know, the same uh, uh, polymer polystyrene that you would see in an FTIR spectrum. And then down below, you see in the Raman spectrum, quite a few features make that spectrum very unique to that material. You know, and then compared to near IR, which you know, is, oh, measures overtones, and you, you need to use some chemometrics to, to extract the uh, chemical information. So 
this is the this is the extent of my experience measuring uh, phthalates, and that was out here last fall in, in your lab. We spent a little time. But I take the you know we took the pure materials, measure them with our 1064, and I just overlay this overlaid the spectra, and you see. You know, we've got uh, you know, one one of these adipates, and then these phthalates, and you see there is uh, more than enough information in these spectra to distinguish all of these materials. <clears throat> you know, and then I, I have a, a, a you know a standard PVC with. Uh, the DOA and then one with the phthalate and you overlay them and you can see the difference it's just it's PVC a, a lot of these the common bands are the PVC vibrational modes and then in particular here is that's a, that's a telltale indicator that there's a phthalate present in the plastic you know, and then the, the the other one down there is 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 the um, the benzene ring. And you know, tr traditionally too, the normal Raman spectroscopy. You know, you, you rule of thumb, you could detect down to half a percent, one percent, but that's a rule of thumb. And this phthalate band, especially the one here around a thousand wave numbers, is so strong that. You know, I haven't <clears throat> undertaken the study uh, as of yet, but I'm, you know, uh, I'm convinced that we can do 0.1 percent. So this would be a you know, it's a point and shoot type of screening tool for detecting phthalates. And much like FTIR, you can do automated library searching. You know, for instance, I can build. A library of these materials and library of plastics with various levels of additives and distinguish them. For, you know, this is just one example. I did a, a collected a spectrum of a, a plastic soda bottle. Perform an automated library search. All of this, everything I'm talking about, the data processing, all that is integrated into this little this little device. And so the best match from the library is is PET. You know, I, I already knew the answer, but it's nice to have confirmation. So onto the marketing side. So this is a um, these are the types of, uh, of different sizes, shapes, products we make. Um, we've got this first guard. And, and, and you know, this is the world's first 1064 near infrared Raman spectrometer. In your hand, you just point, pull a trigger. You know, it will do the search, report a result. Um, then we've got these sort of other form factors and, and, and so on. And the Xanthus one over there is essentially a, a little benchtop instrument. It's battery powered, or you can uh, plug in AC. Um, they all have the, the the same capabilities. In addition, you know, we have a, a lot of accessories for you can invert them in stands and things like that. And some more bench tops. We make microscopes. So, uh, so. If you want to visit the Rigaku booth at PitCon, we're going to have uh, some very novel Raman instruments coming, coming out where they have dual wavelengths. And then this is where I get excited because uh, I like build instruments. So we've got a couple of next generation systems coming, you know, in, in under development that'd be interest to you know people such as yourselves measuring colored plastics. Uh, you know, it's trying to see past the fluorescence. One of them, it's it's sitting here. I took a picture of the of this. It's called shifted excitation Raman difference spectroscopy. You know, and, and 
you know, this is, here's, the, here's the instrument right here. And it has two, la two 785 lasers that are just sh slightly shifted in frequency. So when you measure two sp spectra, it's hard to see here, but there are two overlying curves. They're, they're, they're slightly shifted, but they have the, 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 the concept is that the fluorescence curve is virtually the same because you're going up into the same absorption manifold and fl fluorescing back down. But the Raman peaks are all relative to the laser wavelength, so they shift a little bit. And so you just do a subtraction, you get a derivative spectrum, then you can reconstruct the, the spectrum of the material underneath the fluorescence. There's another pretty neat <clears throat> instrument we're building based on spatially offset Raman spectroscopy. In normal Raman, you're just kind of hitting a diffuse material and looking at backscatter through, through the same uh, set of optics. What spatially offset Raman allows you to do is depth profile, and you can see through <laughs> opaque packaging. It's, it's very interesting. And we're building the first one right now. Uh, I think I titled this Cutting Edge Technology in the Palm of Your Hand, but then I saw it on the bench un undergoing alignment, it, and it's about this big right now. But a couple generations, it'll be, it, it will be into uh, a form factor like this, no doubt. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's it. Any questions? Okay. Questions you see? All right, we have uh, one more talk this afternoon uh, by Michael Gray from uh, Thermo. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael Gray, and I'm with uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific Corporation, uh, working out of Bill Rickham, Massachusetts, uh, specifically in the area that we call portable analytical instruments. Um, just briefly, what that means in, in, in our company is the uh, uh, Thermo, Scientific, Thermo Fisher Scientific, of course, a very large company conglomeration of many divisions. Our division specifically handles portable analytical instrumentation. Uh, made up of what was traditionally the Niton brand of uh, XRF analyzers. And uh, two years ago, or a year and a half ago, we uh, acquired Uhura Scientific and Polychromics uh, in the, uh, basically the IR space with, um, with uh, mid-IR, near-IR, and Raman uh, instrumentation. So what we wanted to talk about today was using a uh, portable FTIR system uh, for detection of phthalates. Uh, it's a little bit different how we look at this. We come from this as a major supplier of portable analytical instrumentation into this industry for lead detection, right? We're the number one, uh, by far and away, the number one supplier of uh, portable, uh, portable XRF spectroscopy uh, instruments for lead detection, cadmium detection, other heavy metals. So coming from that perspective, when we uh, acquired uh, Hura Scientific some years ago, uh, we decided to, that would be our first bridge product of the two new groups. So that's what I wanted to talk about a little bit here. We do not have a product to offer for sale. It's not quite done yet. I'll get into why. But uh, we've done some very good pilot work with a handful of our specific customers, and I just wanted to share with, uh, with everyone where we are in that product roadmap. Um, we're very committed to this business, so uh, we, wanna, we really would want to have a phthalate solution to be a total solutions provider. So from our perspective, I'm looking at what the real problem is out in the marketplace, right? So the regulatory levels are 0.1 percent, 1,000 ppm. Um, however, for the most part, what you'll see in a PVC plasticized material is we see generally things, you know, certainly over 15, 20, 25 percent, up to 50 percent. Uh, very like the, the world of lead, there's a regulatory limit and then there's a practical uh, usage factor, and, and we usually operate in that practical usage area. That's how we've always done it in XRF, and 
uh, we would be taking the same approach to this marketplace. Certainly the substitute plastic saws are more expensive. We all know, right, the, pro the problem that exists out there, much like the, I'll use those analogies again and again, the, 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 the substitutes of lead, bismuth, and titanium and other things are, are expensive as well. Um, it can be at half percent in some plastics. You know, you've got the contamination issue and the recycle issue, so we recognize those issues as well. And for these reasons, there's really no real analytical technique that can do it and when I say can't do any analytical technique, portable analytical technique, I'm thinking on the standard of the XRF. That simple red screen, green screen, you've got lead, you don't have lead. People are looking for the same kind of an answer at our uh, level of the market, end user level, looking for that same kind of do you have a phthalate or don't you have a phthalate. Um, so for the manufacturers, of course, it comes down to that. This is what they look at every day, the manufacturers who are our customers, right? Um, uh, primarily in the XRF world, we're looking at manufacturers of footwear and apparel and toys and various consumer products, and they see these concentrations in very high rates. We know that the substitute materials are very expensive, so they've always got to be on watch that the, um, that the products are made to the specifications that they've agreed. So we know that GCMS is the standard tool. We heard a lot about it today, right? It's a laboratory tool. That's one of the first things we look at is trying to get things out of the laboratory, the need for preparation. Certainly our entire industry, our entire industry of portable analytical instruments is generally built on the not needing to do sample preparation, right? Uh, not just the convenience, but of course the access to non-technical users, the uh, less variability in the process. So not having to do sample prep is a, is a core part of our business proposition and everything we do. Analysis time is generally about a day, but you've got to send samples. Someone third party is doing it, so uh, it's always convenient to have your own analysis technique. And of course, as we've heard before, it's a trace analysis technique. So if you get these very high concentrations, you'll want to dilute them before injecting them into your lab instruments. So these are some of the things that drive us to say that there's probably another solution required in the marketplace. In addition to this, I, it's certainly hard to believe lab testing will ever go away. We need third-party testing. People have to make sure that these things are really, really uh, quantified, what's in them. But much like we've done in the world of lead testing, which we've never displaced lab testing there either, uh, we certainly have a compelling solution for people to do their own everyday testing and, uh, and quality control. So just a bit about FTR. We've seen a lot about it. I didn't realize we'd be talking about um, a couple of sessions before me, so we've all, we've all seen a lot more detailed spectra already. But here it is again, right? It's very obvious, the uh, peaks. We can see these phthalates. They're very clear in, a, in an infrared spectrometer. So this is the, the basis of what we work on. Um, it is a traditional laboratory technique. It's been around a long time, right? It's well understood. It's well understood to our people, so uh, not, a whole, low, low, not a lot of high risk in the process for a standard FTIR. Um, the limited detection is in the percent range for us, so there are some novel techniques that the folks at A2 are doing. Um, we're sticking to kind of a more basic sort of percent range uh, detection as a real screening tool. Um, so it's really useful for that screening at the, uh, at the manufacturer level in their supply chain. So just some background on how all this uh, happened, um, I said briefly in the beginning. So of course, the, under uh, HR 2715 uh, CPSIA, we've got guidance for phthalate con uh, content of 0.1%, of so we all know what it is. Once we had sort of that data in our heads, we had this acquisition of Ahura Scientific, which added the portable FTIR to our uh, Niton suite of instruments. So in trying to decide how to integrate the two groups, we, all, we knew that this portable instrumentation, would, we would become the repository of all portable ac acquisitions or, or developments within the company. How did we add these two together? And this was the first joint project we came to. It was an, it was an ideal project because they had an existing product, which you see the picture of here, called the True Defender FT. And that was um, uh, designed for uh, Homeland Security applications, uh, quite different from this. But it is basic FTIR, and it, it shared a lot of the basic requirements that we had. Simple operation, easy to use by anyone, non-technical people, uh, uh, simple interface. So we thought this would be a good opportunity with our background in this uh, in this regulatory space and the uh, Hura Scientific product having that FTIR background, we thought it would be a great place to bridge over and that's indeed what we did. So what we did was we took that product 
uh, the uh, uh, True Defender FT that you see here. And we, we, we sort of did some modification to it. We rebranded it as a Niton, so just a little explanation of what that means. Thermo Fisher Scientific Corporation uh, is really just a corporation. All products come under the Fisher Scientific brand or the Thermo Scientific brand. So as equipment, we're part of Thermo Scientific. And uh, the Niton product is really a product name. And that's what it is because historically the Niton company was a real brand standard for portable XRF. So now we've broadened that out to be sort of the, the brand name within our company for these, um, for these portable solutions. So we put a Niton name on it because that's what people in this business will recognize. That's what manufacturers of apparel and footwear and toys and consumer products recognize. Uh, the good news on this was they had about 4,000 of these things in the field already, all through, mostly through Homeland Security, but through some other applications as well. So the physical system was very, very well designed, well tested, uh, and, and very low risk. Um, and, and of course, then coming in uh, and adding it to the Niton group under the Niton name, where we are sort of the standard for uh, CPSIA and Prop 65 REACH compliance tools. Uh, the existing or product, a true defender, uh, was then developed and pilot tested under the name Niton FT. And so a little bit about that. So when we went out and we did our pilot, we did a market uh, requirements analysis. We call it within our company VOC, Voice of Customer Study. So we did a study, a market analysis, uh, developed a specification, modified the system somewhat, and then went out to six pilot customers and uh, let them run with it for a couple of weeks and uh, deliver up a lot of data. In some cases, we had labs involved, so we got some good GCMS correlation. Um, and so what we found were a few things. The spec uh, sp uh, specification for the regulatory limit is 0.1 percent. We're really going to talk about the 1 percent range. Uh, comfortably, depending on matrix, uh, you're really at about the 1 percent range. Again, screening tool. Um, in the, we, we discussed the issue of recycling and contamination, but generally speaking at the end user level, they're really looking for that screening tool to keep their manufacturers honest. That's what they've always done with the XRFs and it's very similar to that. Uh, the specification from the market was the ability to analyze all plastics, all different types of plastics, all different hardnesses of plastics. So uh, in the beginning, uh, we, used to, we used to do this by XRF analysis and say if it didn't have chlorine, it's not PVC, it's probably not plasticized. Well, that didn't last very long. I mean, that really wasn't a logical way to go forward. So we really do need to analyze uh, broad range materials. What we're finding is under our ATR, uh, it's pretty flexible. We can get most materials to make contact. Only the really very hard plastics can still be a bit of a challenge. And we have various sample prep techniques uh, to get past that. Just briefly, I'll show you uh, what this tool looks like. This is it. It's just one, one piece in your hand. And we put this thing we call the anvil um, just to get that pressure against the diamond ATR. So you can put the sample inside and clamp it down, and that's how you get the pressure. And we find that that's plenty of pressure to get uh, all but the very, very hard plastics, which generally aren't going to be uh, a phthalate issue anyway. Also, one of the specifications we developed was the detection and speciation of all phthalates, right? Distinguishing bad phthalates from good phthalates and, and so on. Uh, our system is not going to do that. We chose an algorithmic approach that we, pro we will not have on our path uh, speciation of any type. We'll just tell you if it's a grouping of phthalates. But I'll go back again analogously. Our customers in the XRF world, they don't play around with legal limits of lead. They want no lead, right? They just want to see if there's lead or no lead because they want no lead. So in the same way, we're saying we'll just tell you if there's phthalates. And if it's not banned today, it might be banned soon. You might as well just not have phthalates and use alternative plasticizers. But we will not be able to distinguish those phthalates. Uh, the fit form and function specification. Uh, really, the, the spec really was our portable XRF. It's, it's really well adopted. People like it very much. They like the physical package and they wanted it to be as similar to that as possible. Uh, things like simple startup, ease of use, uh, any user can, 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 can use it, long battery life, transportability. I think, did we have the, these come in a small Pelican case, much like our XRF, so you can just put it in a bag, take it and go. Uh, long battery life. So these are the kinds of things that people wanted in this tool as well, and it certainly has all of those uh, those aspects. Uh, simple go, no go, or, or pass, fail, like the handled XRF, no spectroscopy is required. So there's some really, I mean, really the core 
contribution of this thing beyond just the physical packages, the chemometrics techniques that allow for no spectroscopist that really can get us to a go, no go, pass, fail. And our algorithm, we believe, certainly has the legs to get there and, and we're still developing to get to that final stage. But we do believe we will give them that simple red screen, green screen that they're looking for. So a few things about the FT and its pilot, some of the good news. Uh, it is a phthalate screening in a handheld form factor that will give a red green. I mean, that is what it's ultimately going to do. You can see we're putting it out of pocket here. Uh, it's really a nice, convenient, simple to use package. Okay, it meets all of our voice of customer requirements for that ease of use and, and even for performance. It has a simple interface that anybody can use. It does not, you do not have to be an educated spectroscopist or, or a scientist. Any, any user can, uh, can uh, get the benefit of the machine. It's very rugged and it's designed to a military specification because of its homeland security um, history. It's designed to mill spec. It can be dropped from three feet onto concrete. It can be dunked into a solution of, uh, of uh, chlorine bleach for, for cleaning and decontaminating. So it's got a very, very robust physical package. Um, it's got all the performance of a lab system, we say at least a, a you know, qualitative screening technique in a two and a half pound package that you can carry around literally almost in your pocket. Okay? And more importantly, the physics work quite reliably. That was the main thing. So when we talk about our screening operation, the main thing we were concerned with is, does the spectroscopy work? And it does. It works quite well, and we see that all the time. It detects these phthalates uh, quite regularly. Challenges in the system yet to go. We definitely do need some more algorithm work. I say the physics works, but in many cases we're not detecting the phthalate. When we open the spectrum, we see it in there. It's very obvious. Um, but somehow the algorithm isn't always picking it up. And there's a little bit of background on that. Um, the reason for that is we really went into this with a spectral matching program, a spectral matching algorithm. From, from what our customers are really looking for, analogous to what we've done in lead detection, they really would want to see something more like a simple peak identification. But instead of shifting, we were thinking to shift over and just give a simple peak ID because the peaks are so obvious. But then what we found was that people really want on the path, if it's going to be an IR system, an FTIR system, they really want to have at some point that capability of material identification of the base polymer. So we decided we would try to get the best of both. So we're, going to, we're, we're working off of the spectral match algorithm so that we can do a full spectral match. And that we can, as, as said earlier, we can build these libraries. They're very simple to build. Um, uh, they, there's a service offered to the uh, Homeland Security Service where every time they find a new uh, material out there that's not in the library on a 24-7 basis, they email that back and a spectroscopist looks at it and, out, and, and, and absorbs it into the library. And we can do the same thing in this market for, for these customers as well. So we have to develop that algorithm further, but, but, the, but the algorithm we're going to develop off of has a lot of, uh, has, has a lot of extensibility to it. And the final thing is that phthalate image is very clear in the spectrum, but we must detect that the clear message from the customers was 85% or more. At the, at the end user level, at the factory, in the supply chain, if, if they can't 85% of the time identify the polymer and identify whether or not it's got a phthalate, then that's, that's not a usable spec and we're not just not quite there. But that's the algorithm development we're doing to get to that number. We know that number and we're working toward it. And this algorithm wasn't specifically written for phthalates, of course. As I said, we're, we're developing it into this marketplace. Uh, there would be a simpler algorithm that would make it work, but we've opted not to do that because we want to have the future possibility. So again, here was just that, again, that spectrum, you can see it. I mean, we've, we've seen these uh, in a number of other presentations. It's just really, really clear. If you look at that base PVC and then you look at the, all the various uh, phthalates, this is what we're talking about. Even when the machine does a miss, you open up the spectrum and you see it. It's right there. So we know we can get there. So summary, uh, our, the need is still developing the market, right? I mean, it's, 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 it hasn't even peaked yet. Um, the, 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 the final determination in the law was really just last summer, and, uh, and 2011 was the first year where 60-day notices for phthalates surpassed lead, right? And it actually doubled them by the end of the year, so that was really interesting. So phthalates are certainly getting to be a hotter subject than, uh, more than anything else. Um, the portable solution is the only chance for statistically meaningful testing. So we have to have lab testing. We have to certify our product. We have to know it's good. But at the same time, 
to get any sort of statistically meaningful testing because of the cost and difficulty of, of GCMS. If we don't have some sort of portable system out through the supply chain, people are running totally blind and they're going to continue to do so. So we think it's very compelling that people need this solution, so we're determined to, to offer it to them. Um, this product has existed in its physical form for three years. So uh, it's, it's, again, 4,000 of them in the field, so it's pretty low risk from our, from our standpoint. Our pilot showed, again, that we need more algorithm work. We've got to get that algorithm up to the standard of the 85% uh, uh, identification rates. We need better pass-fail functionality. It's not quite red-green screen, green screen yet. Red screen, green screen yet. Um, and the ability to run most of the common materials, even if we have some limits on hard plastics, but I think we've already achieved that one through, the, through this portable anvil device that we have. Um, and then, of course, we have a solid fit, form, and function, and good solid physics, right? In the end of the day, that's the most important thing for our customers at the supply chain level. The customer, the physics work quite reliably. So with that, I thank you, and I uh, thank you, Matt, for having us here. And uh, any, any specific questions? No? No questions? Yes, so, so Uhura Scientific had, I, 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 the, it's around 4,000 units sold at the point we acquired them. Um, mostly. Uh, mostly it's, it's bomb making materials and, uh, and, and specific illicit drugs. Um, uh, there is another application they call Pharmachem, which is, um, which is various industrial applications, the most uh, notable of them being um, uh, material ID for pharmaceutical companies looking for certain. So as you can imagine, it, 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 the Spectrum actually really worked well in those markets, like, like bomb-making materials. There's, only, there's a very small universe of things people use to make bombs, so it's easy for the Homeland Security guys to point shoot into some powder and figure out what the heck it is, and it's very reliable for that. And with the constant building of the library, uh, it really makes it ideal. So that's the history. Anything else? All right, let's thank Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, what we're going to do now is take a quick five-minute break. We're going to break down and set up for the discussion panel, and uh, we'll reconvene then.